Welcome back, everyone, as we get into part three of our look at the Kennedy assassination inside the book depository. Keep your comments coming. Whether you agree with me, you disagree with me, you think that all of this is barking up the wrong tree and that Oswald had nothing to do with it or is a conspiracy, this is what's great about this stuff. We get to talk about it. And I will probably, I'm thinking maybe at the end, after we get through this, I may make, make a video kind of giving some of my feelings about why I agree or disagree with certain theories that are out there. I've interacted with some of you and, and offered my disagreement on some things, but I just can't keep up with all of those. And, and please understand that when I do disagree with you, it's not done out of any kind of malice or hate or anger. Please read it in the tone that it's intended, which is to disagree, disagree strongly and offer why I think you're wrong or why I see things differently, but done so in a way that means, hey, I'm glad you're here and I'm glad you're sharing what you think. Please keep doing that. So I think today we're probably only going to cover uh, chapter 10, which is the sniper's nest. Uh, that's about a 17 minute section of this video. Uh, and then we will cover the last three sections then in the final episode tomorrow. If you haven't seen the first two episodes of my reaction, the link is in the description, and hopefully you've already watched this whole thing on your own. If not, please definitely go and check out the rest of it, or at least check out some of his other stuff so we're making sure we're supporting the original content creators. And I want to give a big shout out to Jordan and to Randy, who are our latest uh, producer level patrons supporting on Patreon. Some updates coming to Patreon this week. I've brought somebody on board my team who is going to be managing the stuff for Patreon so we can do a better job of staying on top of the rewards and the tiers and the interaction and going to be offering a couple of new things with those that you'll be seeing being rolled out this week. So be watching for that stuff. Thanks in advance to all of you who support this channel. Even if it's just watching, leaving a like, commenting, subscribing, it all matters. It all helps. Let's dive into the Sniper's Nest. Following a quick sweep of the roof, Roy Truly and Marion Baker returned to the ground floor of the Book de Paul story. What did you do when you got back to the first floor, or what did you see? When I got back to the first floor, at first I didn't see anything except officers running around, reporters in the place. There was a regular madhouse. Had they sealed off the building yet, do you know? I am sure they had. Then what? Then, in a few minutes, it could have been moments or minutes at a time like that. See, this guy is at least acknowledging, hey, I really don't have a good grasp on what the time was, right? Some people, they're sure of how what the time was, and they may very well be wrong. This guy understands. You know what? Honestly, I don't remember exactly how long it was. And there have been people, some of you commented about this, there have been people that have done tests about th these things where they do experiments and then they interview all the witnesses afterwards to see what they remember, and it varies wildly. Notice some of my boys were over in the west corner of the shipping department, and there were several officers over there taking their names and addresses and so forth. I noticed that Lee Oswald was not among these boys. Oswald was not the only absentee, but he was the only one whom truly knew for a fact had left the building after the shooting. Meanwhile, on the sixth floor, a stack of boxes in the southeast corner attracted the attention of Deputy Luke Mooney. And I want to point out here, because we haven't really been talking about what's going on external to the book depository, that by this point, by the time we're getting to these events, Oswald's already been become a suspect. Uh, so what happens outside of this is that Oswald gets on a bus he leaves the scene immediately, gets on a bus, he goes to an area known as Oak Cliff, where I think he had a house that he stayed in, um, and he's walking down the street when this officer, uh, J.D. Tippett, and his name was J.D., like it didn't stand for anything. Some people have said it stood for Jefferson Davis, it didn't. His name was literally J.D. Uh, here's the uh, description of the suspect go out, 30 years old, slender build, dark hair, you know, and all these things like that. Uh, and he sees Oswald walking down the sidewalk in this neighborhood, and he pulls up alongside of him and starts talking to him through the window. Then he stops and gets out of the car 
And according to the witnesses, as he came around to confront Oswald directly, he was shot three times, including in the head. And then Oswald runs into a movie theater, and there's where he is found. He gets into a scuffle with police, and he's taken into custody. All of that happens while this is going on. I went straight across to the southeast corner of the building, and I saw these high boxes. And the minute I squeezed between these two stacks of boxes, I had to turn myself sideways to get in there. That is when I saw the expended shells, and the boxes that were stacked up looked to be a rest for the weapon. Two windows west of the sniper's nest, authorities found a bottle of Dr. Pepper and some chicken bones, leftovers from the lunch eaten by Bonnie Williams shortly before the assassination. But according to some officers, including Mooney, remains of a similar meal were also found in the sniper's nest. Does this photograph show any place where you saw the chicken bone? If I recall correctly, the chicken bone could have been laying on this box, or it might have been laying on this box right here. There was one of them partially eaten. See, even the police don't remember this stuff exactly. There was a little small paper poke. By poke, you mean a paper sack. Right. The assassin could just maybe take one step and lay it over there if he was the one that put it there. In spite of this, no such items were ever photographed. Apart from the sack of chicken bones found here, there are no records of leftovers being recovered from anywhere else near the sniper's nest. Now, did you see a chicken bone over near the boxes in the southeast corner? I don't believe there was one there. You didn't see any. One witness, a deputy sheriff named Luke Mooney, said he found a piece of chicken partly eaten on top of one of the boxes. Did you so I have to point out at this point such an indication of this being the 1960s South, right? How many people are named after Robert E. Lee? Lee Harvey Oswald, his father's name was Robert Edward Lee Oswald. His brother was a Robert Edward Lee Oswald Jr. And then Lee is named, and they were distant cousins. Like Lee Harvey Oswald, Oswald was like a fifth cousin, five times removed to Robert E. Lee. They were both descended from the Carter family. Uh, but just, it's one of those just little things. And some of you have pointed out uh, that in some of these testimonies that we're seeing, there's things that are redacted or that they're changed, and it'll say in parentheses, black person. It's probably an indication that the person used some other word to describe them. Uh, not necessarily maybe a real, like a seriously derogatory word, like, you know, the N-word, but they might have used some other words that maybe aren't really considered to be appropriate to use today. So I get why he changed that stuff. Do you see anything like that? No. Was anything like that called to your attention? I can't recall anything like that. But it wasn't just the chicken bones. There were similar disagreements regarding the three cartridge cases. According to Mooney, Dallas Police Captain William Fritz tampered with the evidence. Are those the empty shells you found? Yes, sir. Now, will you take this marker and encircle the shells? All right. They were turned over to Captain Fritz? Yes, sir. He was the first officer that picked them up, as far as I know, because I stood there and watched him go over and pick them up and look at them. Is this the position of the cartridges, as shown in this photograph, as you saw them? Yes, sir. That is just about the way they were laying, to the best of my knowledge. I do know there was one further away, and these other two were relatively close to each other on this particular area. But these cartridges, this one and this one, looks like they are further apart than they actually was. Mm. Now, I didn't quite understand. Did you say that it was your memory that A and B were not that close together? Just from my memory, it seems that this cartridge ought to have been over this way a little further. You mean the B cartridge should be closer to the C? Closer to the C, yes, sir. Hmm. Mooney did not explicitly state, but strongly implied that Captain Fritz moved at least one of the cartridge cases before they were photographed. See, again, this is the kind of stuff that, in my mind, and I understand why some of you disagree with how I see this, but please, the, the arguments that I haven't done my research or that I'm ignoring evidence and I'm blind to the facts, that's not the case. I've looked at all the same evidence. Some people are saying, look, just look at the facts and you'll come to a different conclusion. I have looked at the facts. That's why I have the conclusion that I do. But it's this kind of stuff that causes doubts in people's minds and leads people to look at conspiracy theories, right? 
we can all agree that even if Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone, and I believe he did, uh, in, in killing the president, I am open to the possibility that other people were involved in getting him to that place. Maybe. Not sure. At the very least, though, there is a lot of incompetence that went into all of this, both before the assassination and after. For example, the FBI had Oswald on their radar screen. They had been investigating him because it was communist ties. He was handing out literature, stuff like that. Uh, at the very least, so much of the conspiracy theorists are fueled by stuff that didn't need to happen. According to Fritz, he did everything by the book. I told them not to move the cartridges, not to touch anything till we could get the crime lab to take pictures of them, just as they were lying there. And I left an officer assigned there to see that that was done. And the crime lab came almost immediately and took pictures and dusted the shells for prints. Amidst the swarm of officers canvassing the sixth floor was a lone journalist by the name of Thomas Ollier. Ollier was equipped with a camera and actually filmed much of the frantic search effort. Hmm. About three decades later, Ollier made some rather startling claims that were largely consistent with, but also expanded upon those made by Mooney. All right, I don't know what he said, but I'm going to stop right here. And I'm just going to say up front, no matter what it is that he says here, that understand that a person talking... Everybody has an agenda. Anybody who speaks has a bias, has an agenda, has something they're hoping to accomplish by speaking. And just off the top of my head, if I'm looking at a journalist speaking months after, or years, even decades after the fact, I'm wondering what is their agenda? Are they trying to get stuff in the press? Are they trying to sell a book? Are, or are they just acting out of a desire to make sure that the facts are known? I don't know. After filming the casings, I asked Captain Fritz, who was standing at my side, if I could uh, go And there you go. Secrets from the sixth floor window. So um, he's inter so somebody's interviewing this guy in 1994. So there's your time frame, 31 years later. He's not the one writing the book, but he's being interviewed three decades after. Find the barricade and get a close-up shot of the casings. He told me that it would be better if I got my shots from outside the barricade. He then rounded the pile of boxes and entered the enclosure. This was the first time anybody walked between the barricade and the windows. Fritz then walked to the casings, picked them up, and held them in his hand over the top of the boxes for me to get a close-up shot of the evidence. I filmed about eight seconds of a close-up shot of the shell casings in Captain Fritz's hand. While these Please tell me he was wearing portions gloves. of Ollie's film have never surfaced, preservation took a back seat while the film was being prepared for broadcast. Portions of the film were carelessly chopped up and discarded, and fragmentary clips are all that remains today. In any case, after supposedly filming the casings in the hand of Captain Fritz, Ollie recalled how they were deceitfully returned to the floor. Over 30 minutes later, Captain Fritz reached into his pocket and handed the casings to Detective Robert Studebaker. Studebaker never saw the original placement of the casings, so he tossed them on the floor and photographed them. To Competence. counterbalance these allegations of foul play, I must also mention that there were those who found nothing amiss about the cartridge cases. Did you see a picture taken of the holes? Yes, sir. When the picture was taken, were the holes in the same position as when you had first seen them? This is the most important investigation that these cops will ever be involved in. And you do something as careless as throwing that stuff in your pocket, probably touching it with no gloves on, anything like that, and then throwing them back down. That's inexcusable. It's not, I don't think it's, it's like, I don't think there's a cover up here. I don't think there's an intent to deceive. I think it's just really bad police work on this part, guy's part. Yes, sir, they were. Even Mooney sort of agreed that the casings had not been moved, immediately after explaining that they had been moved. In the testimony we heard a few minutes ago, Mooney was shown this photograph. He then examined this one, taken from a different angle, before being shown this one. Now, these two are just differently cropped copies of the same photograph. I have another picture. Here is a picture taken, also from another angle. Does that show the cartridges? Yes, sir. Now, compare that with the other photograph. Yes, sir. Is that about the way it looked? Yes, sir. That is right. It sure is. That doesn't really gel with the casing supposedly being picked up and haphazardly tossed back on the floor, as Thomas Ollier would claim decades later. See, I didn't... 
I didn't get that impression from what he said there. I thought he was just saying, yeah, it looks the same as the other picture, but maybe I'm wrong. While there are question marks surrounding the chicken bones and the cartridge cases, there can be no Minor doubt stuff. that some of the boxes in the sniper's nest were moved prior to being photographed. Do you have any pictures of the boxes near the window before they were moved, other than those you have showed me? Just these two. Then you don't have any pictures taken of the boxes before they were moved? No. Now, I will show you another picture. Was that taken by you? Yes. Does that show the position of the boxes before or after they were moved? That's after they were dusted. There's fingerprint dust on every box. Yep. And they were not in that position then when you first saw them? No. Several minutes after the sniper's nest was discovered, a bolt-action rifle was found between two rows of boxes near the stairway. Now, there was some initial confusion regarding its make and model. Some thought it looked like a mouser, but upon closer inspection, it was identified as an Italian Carcano. The so, I want to check on something because this is 52 minutes, almost an hour after the shooting. I think Oswald may have already been in custody at this point before they even found the gun. So, let me take a look real quick, though. Okay, so... This is 1.22 p.m. Kennedy is pronounced dead around 1 o'clock uh, Central Time. So this is just after he's been pronounced dead at the hospital. Uh, this is about seven minutes after Oswald has shot and killed Officer Tippett. He's going to be arrested in the movie theater uh, at around 1.50. So at this point, Oswald has killed a cop. And he's run. 13 witnesses see him kill the cop. Several, I think like five or six of them are going to identify him in a lineup that night. Uh, but he hasn't been arrested yet at this point. Now, there was some initial confusion regarding its make and model. Some thought it looked like a mouser, but upon closer inspection, it was identified as an Italian Carcano. The officer who misidentified the rifle later explained that he did so at a glance. However, over a decade after the assassination, in 1976, a former deputy sheriff by the name of Roger Craig claimed to have seen the marking 7.65 Mauser stamped right on the barrel of the rifle. To some, this is evidence that a Mauser was in fact discovered on the sixth floor before being swapped for a Carcano. But Craig was the only person to make this specific claim, did so many years after the assassination, and after telling a journalist the following. 14 years later, a single solitary person says something that nobody else saw. They have the gun. We, we have the gun to this day. Um, these are outliers that you just have to really disregard. It's not evidence of a conspiracy. Did you handle that rifle on the sixth floor? Yes, I did. I couldn't give its name because I don't know foreign rifles. I know it was foreign made and you loaded it downward into a built-in clip. But there was another rifle, a Mauser, found up on the roof of the depository that afternoon. There were no reports of a Mauser being found on the roof either. Besides, the only rifle seen in the film taken by Thomas Ollier is unmistakably a Carcano. Unique markings on the cartridge cases would later prove that this was indeed the rifle from which all three had been fired. Before the day was over, the rifle had been traced to a company in Chicago, Illinois, the company had sold the rifle to someone named A. Hidel and shipped it to a post office box in Dallas in early 1963. Alec James Hidel was a pseudonym known to have been used by Oswald. So there was now a direct link between the shells, the rifle, and Oswald. So now, this is really important because this is direct evidence, right? They've got a gun in the depository on the sixth floor where many witnesses have said they heard or saw gunshots or saw a rifle. You have a physical description that fits Oswald pretty darn close. It's a little old on the age, but you know what? Honestly, if I'm looking at him, I'm thinking he's he's around 30 years old. I'm not thinking he's only 24. Um, and people aged, typically aged sooner back then. Like if you look at people who were in their 40s back then, they look older than 40s. Um, but uh, plus from a distance. Uh, but then honestly, it's him killing the cop is what gets him arrested so quick. If he had gotten off that bus, gone into the house he was staying at, and stayed there, 
different story, right? I mean, it takes. A, they're obviously going to be on his trail, and they're going to be looking for him. They're going to identify him as the suspect at some point uh, once they tie him to this gun. But he got people's on people's radar screen much quicker because he leaves the house after a couple minutes and immediately gets spotted by a cop. Not only that, but Oswald's prints were lifted from both the rifle and boxes in the sniper's nest. Apart from the spent shells and the rifle, authorities discovered one other key piece of evidence. Did you find anything else up in the southeast corner of the sixth floor? Yes, sir. We found this brown paper sack, or case. It was made out of heavy wrapping paper. Actually, it looks similar to the paper that those books in the building was wrapped in. It was just a long, narrow paper bag. The bag was alleged to have been found here, yet this space is suspiciously empty in all the crime scene photographs. How long was the paper bag, approximately? I don't know. I picked it up and dusted it for prints, and they took it down there and sent it to Washington. And that's the last I'd seen of it, and I don't know. Did you take a picture of it before you picked it up? No. Does that sack show in any of the pictures you took? No, it, it doesn't show in any of the pictures. Detective Robert Studebaker, who had been working as a forensic assistant for less than two months, neglected to explain why he never photographed mm. the bag. Yep. In Studebaker's defense, no one was on the lookout for a brown paper bag. Assassin, sure, rifle, casings, absolutely, but some debris in a dark-lit corner of the room. It wasn't until the bag was picked up and inspected that its significance became apparent. Do you remember anything about what the sack looked like? Well, it was assumed at the time that it was the sack that the rifle was wrapped up in when it was brought into the building. Now, we have to be careful here, and you, some of you might pick up on this. You don't want to jump to that assumption, right? You don't, you don't just want to look at something and say, oh, well, this must be what he carried it in, right? You can, you can investigate if it was, like, maybe this is what it was, but I, I don't like that they start by assuming that. Maybe that's just his wording. I don't know. And it appeared that it could have been used for that. Could have been used. Okay, that's Now, fair. as you may recall, Wesley Frazier drove Oswald back to Irving on November rods. 21st to pick up some curtain rods. The following morning, Oswald was seen carrying a package by both Frazier and his sister, Lenny Randall. According to Frazier, Oswald told him the package contained curtain rods, which he then brought back to Dallas. But you may also recall that Jack Doherty denied seeing such a package. Did you see Oswald come to work that morning? Yes, when he first came into the door. Did he have anything in his hands or arms? Well, not that I could see of. The thing is, Doherty was not a reliable witness. When questioned by the FBI and Secret Service, he appeared very confused about times and places. He required assistance from his father due to considerable difficulty in coordinating his mental faculties with his speech. While Doherty denied having such issues, his testimony is nonetheless riddled with contradictions. Wait a minute, did you go to lunch? Well, I went back downstairs to eat lunch, yes sir. What time? Oh, it was 12 o'clock. Wait a minute, did you hear the shots before or after your lunch? Before, before I ate my lunch. You heard shots before you ate your lunch? Let's see, yes, I See, and, and when you, if you're ever on a jury, I've been on a jury for a, a drive-by shooting case, I ended up the foreman of the jury, uh, you'll be told in your instructions that as the juror, you have to decide on your own or as a group when you start having deliberations whether or not you believe witnesses, right? You have to determine for yourself the credibility of individual witnesses. And we had that happen in our case, right? There were some witnesses that we found very credible, and then there were other witnesses that seemed believable, like they came across as believable, but as we started talking, we're like, nah, we just don't believe it. Like when we had our deliberations, we just didn't believe the witness. Uh, and I feel like this is a case where this guy just, he doesn't seem to get his facts straight. And if he can't get that stuff right, then you really can't follow anything else he said either. I believe I did. Now, did you hear a shot either before or after lunch? It was before lunch. It, it was before lunch. You think it was before lunch you heard the shot? I believe it was. Yes, hmm. sir. While Doherty insisted that Oswald had nothing in his hands when he arrived at work, it turned out that this certitude was based on nothing but a glance. 
Now, is that a very definite impression that you saw Oswald that morning when he came to work? Well, oh, it's like this. I'll try to explain it to you this way. You see, I was sitting on the wrapping table, and when he came in the door, I just caught him out of the corner of my eye. Not Given reliable. that Fraser had eyes on Oswald for several minutes, the weight of evidence suggests he carried a package to work on the morning of November the 22nd. A far more contentious question is whether the package carried by Oswald was the same as the brown paper bag discovered on the sixth floor. Did they show it to According him? According to both Randall and Fraser, the only two witnesses known to have seen the package, the answer was a definite no. Hmm. Now, was the length of the package any similar to the bag? Anywhere near similar? Well, it wasn't that long. I mean, it was folded down at the top, as I told you. It definitely wasn't that long. Yeah, that's explainable. I though. told the FBI that as far as the length of the bag, I told them that was entirely too long. Their main source of contention was that the package carried by Oswald was shorter than the brown paper bag. The bag was just long enough to store the rifle in its disassembled state, so if the package carried by Oswald was much shorter, then it could not have contained the rifle. Except, Randall saw it briefly at a distance through a window, while Fraser never paid it much attention. See, I... I wouldn't be able to tell the difference between 27 inches and 34 inches in a situation like that, but that's just me. Did it look to you as if there was something heavy in the package? Well, I'll be frank with you, I didn't pay much attention to the package. In fact, the length of the package seemed about as certain to Fraser as his lack of attention to it. I didn't pay much attention. I didn't pay too much attention. I didn't pay any attention to it. I didn't pay much attention to the package. I didn't look at the package very much. Like I say, I didn't pay that much attention to it. I didn't. So honestly, to me, even if you throw out the evidence of him carrying a package to work that day, I, I think he's still got plenty here. Pay too much attention to how he carried the package at all. The tape and paper with which the brown paper bag had been constructed matched the tape and paper used to wrap books for shipping on the first floor of the Book to Paul story. Not only that, but a fingerprint and palm print matching that of Oswald were also found on the bag. Seems pretty In spite of all me. this, some authors refused to accept that the brown paper bag and the package carried by Oswald were one and the same. Instead, the argument tends to be that the bag was fabricated by authorities in an effort to frame Oswald. But you then have to I don't think they needed that to frame him. I think they had enough evidence otherwise. Compare that against no curtain rods being found inside the Book to Paul story, Oswald already having curtains in his rented room in Dallas, him failing to obtain permission from his landlady to redecorate, him supposedly being in such urgent need of curtain rods that he just had to return to Irving on Thursday instead of waiting just one more day, him neglecting to mention anything about curtain rods to his wife and Ruth Payne upon his arrival, and that's despite the fact that Payne actually had some spare curtain rods in her garage. See, I'll be honest. I don't think Oswald decided to kill the president until maybe a day or two before. I think the opportunity presented itself and he took it. I really don't think this was something he planned months in advance. I don't think he ordered this rifle with intentions to use it on the president. I don't think he got the job at the depository looking to kill the president from there. In fact, he had applied for another job that he didn't get right around that time too. So um, I think this was a crime of opportunity. The same garage where Oswald stored his rifle. How did you learn of the shooting of President Kennedy? I was watching television and Ruth said someone had shot at the president. What did you say? It was uh, hard for me to say anything. We both turned pale. I went to my room and cried. Did you think immediately that your husband might have been involved? No. Did Mrs. Payne say anything about the possibility of your husband being involved? No, but she only said that, by the way, they fired from the building in which Lee is working. My heart dropped. I then went to the garage to see whether the rifle was there, and I saw that- You see, she says no, but if you are sure your husband wasn't involved, why do you go check and see if the rifle's missing? See, in a lot of these cases, they know, right? They know. They know something just doesn't. I'm not saying she knew ahead of time, but I'm saying at this point, she's she suspects it's possible. The blanket was still there, and I said, thank God. Did you look in the blanket to see if the rifle was there? 
I didn't unroll the blanket. It was in its usual position, and it appeared to have something inside. When did you learn that the rifle was not in the blanket? When the police arrived and asked whether my husband had a rifle, and I said yes. Then what happened? They began to search the apartment. When they came to the garage and took the blanket, I thought, well, now they will find it. They opened the blanket, but there was no rifle there. Around the time of the rifle's discovery on the sixth floor of the book depository, Captain William Fritz was appraised of Oswald's absence. Fritz immediately left the building and returned to police headquarters. We were standing in the hallway when Captain Fritz walked in. He walked up to my colleagues and made the statement to them, go get a search warrant and pick up a man named Lee Oswald. And I asked the captain why he wanted him, and he said, well, he was employed down at the book depository, and he had not been present for a roll call of employees. And we said, Captain, we will save you a trip, because there he sits. Already had him. That, to me, is such a fascinating part of this case, right? The investigation at the book depository is already on to Lee Harvey Oswald, but they've already got him in custody because he just shot a cop in Oak Cliff. So it's amazing how quickly this came together. And people think that that's evidence of a conspiracy. I think it's evidence of the fact that Oswald didn't plan this out. And when he left and he got confronted by a cop, he panicked and he shot him and he ran. All right, so we're gonna wrap it up right there. Fascinating stuff. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. Let's keep the conversation going. We're all learning together. Let's challenge each other's ideas and views and biases and all come out knowing a little bit more than we did before on the other side. We'll see you tomorrow with the last part. Thanks for watching.